Hello again. We are live for another archaeology coffee hour. I'm Elizabeth Reitz from the University of Iowa Office of the State Archaeologist, and I'm really excited to introduce Dale Henning and Megan Meserol for today's coffee hour. Um, both of them I just hold in the highest regard, and I think they're wonderful. I'm really looking forward to learning all about Dale in this interview today. So as with the other programs, we'll have questions towards the end, maybe the, the back 15 minutes of the program. But at any time, you can put your, your um, comments in Facebook or YouTube in the little uh, chat box or comment box, and we'll see it. We'll get to those comments then uh, about in about 40, 45 minutes. So enjoy this program. Hi, everybody. So I'll kind of introduce myself again a little bit too here and uh, just talk about a little bit how I know Dale. Uh, and then I'll go through some questions for you, Dale. But um, so yeah, I'm Megan Messerol and I am the archaeologist for the Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, based out of Des Moines. Uh, but before I worked here, I worked for the Sanford Museum in Cherokee, Iowa, and that is where I first met Dale. Uh, Dale would come and stop over at the museum and he would use our collections to do uh, whatever research he was working on. Uh, and Dale was one of the first Iowa archaeologists I met uh, while, since I moved from Minnesota to Iowa about six years ago. Um, and it was definitely an honor to work with you and uh, learn as much as I could from you, especially about uh, Pipestone tablets. That was one of my favorite things to sit and chat with you about, but also the Oneota people. Uh, but yeah, so I'm excited though. So I think I'm going to learn quite a bit more about you today uh, just by going through some of these questions. Uh, but so to start, Dale, why don't you just kind of give us a brief overview of yourself? Um, where did you grow up? How did you end up here in Iowa? Uh, you know, I say brief, but, you know, take all the time you want. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. At my age, you don't do brief overviews, <laughs> <clears throat> but yep. I'll try to uh, at least get started. Yeah, I grew up in Decorah, Iowa, and uh, for a time lived on a small farm on the edge of town. And uh, we moved into town. When I was probably third grade, um, whatever age that is, nine, ten, something like that. Mm -hmm. And we moved into an interesting and fun neighborhood. Uh, the uh, dentist next door spoke Norse better than he spoke English. The doctor up the road, up the street, also spoke Norse, and I couldn't understand much of what he said in English. But across the street uh, was Doc Field and his family. He had uh, children about my age and, and younger. And uh, Doc had a collection of Indian relics, which I found absolutely fascinating. And he took pity on me uh, and said, would you like to come and look for stones, agates, Indian relics, fossils, whatever we can find here in Northeast Iowa is what we look for. Oh, I thought that was wonderful. And his kids didn't care much to go at all. In fact, they hated going because they thought it was boring. So I filled in the boring seat and uh, went along with Doc Field, who uh, encouraged me from about that time forward to um, do archeology span and to maybe become an archeologist. Uh, that went variously. Anyway, uh, the trips were part of my growing up. I found my first arrowhead one block away from my house where the uh, some crew had uh, years before buried a light pole and any bare ground I looked in, I looked to see what I might find. And sure enough, there was a little triangular arrow point and a few little pieces of fragments of bone. Um, I collected the arrow point and dashed for Doc Field who blessed it and said, yes, you have found an Oneota point. Oh boy, that was wonderful. And uh, I think that and field got me going on this whole thing. 
In the course of uh, many trips, mostly into Al McKee County, I met Cliff Chase, who worked with the telephone company, and visited and, vi and traveled some with Ellison Orr, who uh, about that time was in his 80s. <clears throat> and I saw his collection, and I met with him a number of times and decided that if I ever got to be old, I sure wanted to be like Ellison Orr. Uh, I am not, but um, he, is, he was a kind, gentle person. Um, one time I found a fossil, and I don't even remember what it was, but he told me what it was, and I wrote it down and uh, took the fossil home, and about a, oh, two or three days later, I got a note from Ellison Orr. He had given me the wrong name for the fossil, and this was the right name. I am sorry to this day that I don't have that correspondence, but oh, yeah. when you're a kid, things disappear. Mm -hmm. In the course of my association with Field, I joined the Iowa Archaeological Society. I am sure I'm a charter member, which might make me the oldest member that the society has. I I've never that's right. yeah. but um, I was in college at the time, and um, we had the initial meeting, and quite a number of people came from really all over the state um, and started the society, which I thought was fun. I also got in on the uh, beginnings for Effigy Mounds National Monument and uh, met often enough with Will Logan, who became a continuing and lifetime friend, and the director whose name I had written down, I don't remember at the moment. Growing up with Field was not only interesting intellectually, which is some of what the collecting was about, but um, he did some really interesting things and fun things for the neighbor kids. We were getting toward the end of the Second World War, and Doc Field had come to the end of his collection of fireworks, and he had a huge rocket that he was going to set off. This came with a number of lessons on safety, and uh, two or three of us kids that were nearby were given safety lesson, lessons on how to fire a rocket. So he made a V-shaped trough, and he set it up just so down in his backyard, which was the old floodplain. And um, he said, now you tell all your friends, that we're going to set this off just about dark. So actually, he gathered up probably 15 or so kids, plus his family, and um, it just was almost dark, and he said, all right, stand back, go back up on the hill and sit there, and I'll go down and light the fire, or light the uh, firework. So he did, and he lit it, and it lit beautifully. It went up into the air, probably 50 feet, and turned around. It turned around, and it headed down back toward the ground, and right <laughs> after field who could make tremendous speed running and <laughs> ran as fast as he could go with this rocket literally right behind him. He glanced back, saw it was too late, fell on the ground, and the rocket went up over at the top of this audience. We're all laughing uproariously and uh, blew up. Oh my. <laughs> so he got up and he said, see, I told you those things were dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, that was not a career buster by any means, but now you've been introduced to Doc Field. Yeah. Life uh, in many ways went that way uh, fairly continuously. He taught me a great deal. He taught me about patience, uh, with some exceptions. Uh, his excavation methods for uh, especially sto uh, storage pits and even some burials that fell out of the road when we were prospecting uh, were what I would say today atrocious. But um, even I as a kid thought, boy, this doesn't look 
pretty care. It looks a little careless to me. Sure. Anyway, Doc helped me grow up, and I still appreciate it. I went to Luther College, and I thought, boy, I'd like to be an archaeologist. So I foolishly mentioned that to someone. They said, well, we don't teach archaeology here, but one of our historians does some archaeology and did some archaeology in Egypt. Well, I wasn't interested in Egypt at all. I was interested in Iowa, and no one there was. So I took a history major, graduated uh, without honors, and was drafted into the Army shortly after I graduated. When I got out, oh, I served time in Germany, which was far better than Korea, which was the other option. Sure. Got out of the Army and went back to school, and I thought, I don't want to be a poor archaeologist. I want to make some money. I'll go to dental college. Well, I went through a year of pre-dental work, which involved taking chemistry and physics back to back, mm -hmm. along with practical zoology and so on. But I took one course in anthropology just because it looked interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I got slightly hooked on that first course, so I took a second one on uh, North American archaeology. That was pretty serious, and I really enjoyed it. So I signed up for the field school, and that's when I was introduced to the Sanford Museum in Cherokee. We billeted in the school across from the chair from uh, the Sanford, which is still standing, and um, ate our meals down in the kitchen at the Sanford Museum. Had our had a cook. We worked in the laboratory, which was much smaller than it is now, and. Um, I genuinely, genuinely enjoyed that whole experience. Was that at the yeah. FIPS site that you worked that time? We worked Dale? on the FIPS site, yes. Sure. And we were the second season, and um, it was fantastic. Oh, you found things. That was <laughs> always fun. Yeah. When that field school was over, I went to Professor Rupe, who had taught the field school, and said, I think I would like to become a major in anthropology. Well, he gave me dozens of reasons not to do so, encouraged me by saying, finally, well, if you do this, you might get a job as a part-time seasonal ranger with the Park Service. Well, it sounded a little part-time and probably partly poor pay, but I went ahead and did it anyway. I got my first job just about the time the field school was over, and so was my GI Bill. And uh, so I wrote down to the University of Missouri, Carl Chapman, and asked if he had any work. I was amazed because I got a contract back almost immediately. And he asked if he told me to sign the contract and I could start in September. Uh, I was replacing Ray Wood and Richard Marshall, and um, I had lots of things that he wanted me to do, which I did. It was one year of solid field work. Let's see, two weeks in the field, then one week back in Columbia <laughs> to write up what we had done, which is um, amazing. I don't know how I ever got through all that because uh, we did short excavations and we worked up all the material. And uh, what I did was to dictate my paper or my report. The typist would type it up, I would proof it and send it back and that was the final copy. I haven't seen any of those reports for a long time. I'm not sure I want to, mm -hmm. but um, I stayed on at the University of Missouri for several years and um, wound up directing the Museum of Anthropology and uh, teaching one course, on plus doing field work in the um, summers. Then went to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin. Sure. 
before we went, before I went to graduate school at Wisconsin was the last field season. And this was when I began to find things that probably should not exist. Because my career is several high points among them, finding things that um, hadn't been found before. We tackled an archaic mound, which um, was at the end of a mound that was late woodland. The late woodland people had built onto it. The mound that we dug was about 30 feet in diameter and about four feet deep. And what it had in it was archaic material that was burials, cremations, random bone in about four layers. And I had no experience with human skeleton at all. So we got a little handbook that one of the staff people at Missouri had written, and it had the bones identified and some sketches. And we used that to identify the bones that we were taking out, some of which were cremated, some of which were not, and all manner of positions that, well, that mound should have taken a year and a half for a group to dig, but we had about a um, month and a half. <laughs> and this was a contract, you couldn't leave the mound open. So we went ahead and, and excavated the mound and eventually reported on it in a Missouri archeologist. That was the beginning of a career of finding things that shouldn't be there. Okay, graduate school was as scary as could be. Um, I didn't consider myself a great student, partly because the great students I knew had been in classes with me and to compete with them, I, I seemed to have to work very hard. And I foolishly ruined um, when I was doing my MA with my brother-in-law who had um, perfect memory. He could read a, a page and it was there. Not only that, he could glance at the page and pick up the uh, captions under a photograph and remember the photograph as well. He seemed to do pretty well in uh, medical school where he was engaged and uh, got more sleep through medical school than probably any other student there because of this capability, which he showed off to me fairly regularly. Um, that wasn't, that was kind of an ego buster, but I went on and when I got to graduate school at the doctoral level, I was scared to death. I thought this was going to be the end of Dale, but I did okay. Uh, got through it and enjoyed my fellow students. I enjoyed my professors and um, it went just fine, which I was a little surprised at, but um, did it. In the course of that, I worked for the uh, Center for Climatic Research and the department and did a research project on Mill Creek. And um, by that time, Frank Forder, who was the original director at the Sanford Museum had departed and he was replaced by another person who was not Frank Forder. And uh, I'd say gave us a fairly hard time. He seemed to be in competition with what we were doing. Nonetheless, we got through that, excavated five sites. A couple of them were six and eight feet deep and uh, collected the data that the people in climatic research wanted, as well as uh, massive collections of artifacts from uh, particularly those two deep sites. We got them written up and they are published in an Iowa Archaeological Society uh, publication, volume 16, 15 and 16. That was done and my career with um, Mill Creek began 
mm-hmm. and has continued in many ways. I'm started. Do you have another question? Oh, well, if you you can continue if you'd like, but yeah, I you've answered a, a few of my first ones. Three minutes in the introduction for, of me. So <laughs> sure. Oh yeah, we can we can go on to a couple of these other ones, but okay. Um, so this is a pretty typical um, question that almost all archaeologists get, but uh, I feel like our audience would enjoy, appreciate it too. But what would you consider to be the coolest thing you've ever found? <laughs> It's probably well, hard to narrow that, down. I knew that was coming. Yep. And you can't really narrow it down to only one. Yeah. But in my memory, the little triangular point that I found when I was young mm-hmm. um, was pretty cool. And I still remember it quite well. There were other things uh, that um, items that turned up in uh, some Mill Creek sites. Um, But for the most part, once you become professionally involved, it's um, usually the whole site that strikes you rather than individual objects Mm -hmm. in it. Um, The the little arrow point still sits in my mind because it was a single object. But um, some of the sites that I worked on were truly fantastic. The fifth site certainly was. I was going to say, so that leads me into my next question, which is what was your favorite uh, Iowa archaeological site? Oh, Blood Run, I'm sure. And why? Tell tell us a little more about Blood Run and why it sticks out to you. We did, let's see, when I began to be interested in Oneota culture, as an archeological uh, phenomenon. Mildred Wadel, whom you always listen to with great care, said to me, well, if you're interested in Oneota, you've got to see the material from Blood Run. Mm -hmm. Okay, I had never heard of Blood Run, but uh, there was a collection at the University of Iowa that had been made uh, when Ellison Orr did a project on um, Let's see, Blood Run. Yeah, I think he did something up there. I'm a little faint on that. I didn't look him up. Mm-hmm. But um, Keyes had a large collection from Blood Run. And the combination was something I went through, um, looked at it, and I thought, very interesting. But I didn't know enough about Oneota to really um, get on to it. We did a Center for Climatic Research project on Blood Run in which we were to dig one burial mound in order to get at a clean surface under the mound. And we did. And that's when I met the Dieters who lived on the site or very Mm -hmm. near the site. And Carl Dieters took us up in an airplane ride over the site. Wow. And when I saw that site, I was, you know, you're on the ground, you see what's there. But when we flew over that site and saw the mounds south of where we were excavating, I couldn't believe it. Hmm. Um, You could see then at least 100 mounds, and some of them were six feet high, even after 100 years of cultivation. Wow. So... Carl had a little trouble starting his plane, which he had brought close to the where we were working on a field. And uh, the field was pretty wet uh, and the plane wouldn't start. But he said, oh, don't worry about that. And he got out of the plane, set things up and hand cranked it. And it, it started and did fine. Then taking off, he said, this may be a little slow because we're in some mud. <laughs> yeah. I was a nervous flight person. Anyway. I didn't like flying. And yeah. I knew I wasn't going to like it. But um, he finally got the plane off just short of the fence. And uh, that was our ride. We did a couple circles around the site. And I was impressed because it is an impressive site. 
And the more research I do on that site, which I have continued to do right up till this morning, um, the more I learn about it and the more fascinating it is. Can you give us a little overview of what Blood Run is for some of our audience that might not know? So it's located in Northwest Iowa. It's a series of villages which are linked with um, some kind of blank spaces as far as we know. They extend five miles north, south, or along the Big Sioux River. It's one of very few sites that I know of that has occupation or village on two sides of a river. Usually a river was regarded as a protective item. These people didn't seem to need protection. The um, mounds are unique on an Oneota site. There are some sites with mounds on them, but this site, when it was first visited by archeologists, had something on the order of 275 large mounds that could wow. be seen on the surface. That is impossible. It just wasn't done by Oneota people. Mm -hmm. And also on the surface were boulder outlines. These are boulders about the size of our heads that had been laid side by side. And they were, I'm sure, the anchor for the covering of lodges. Sure. Some of these were over 100 feet long and 30 feet wide. There were others that were circular, 30 feet in diameter, down to six feet in diameter. I have no idea what those latter uh, house or uh, outlines were for. There was also a snake effigy and an enclosed area. The effigy and the enclosure and all of the rock outlines are gone. They've been cultivated away. Uh, the Rude Brothers, whose um, farm was south of where we were digging, back in the 60s, said that evenings were spent by the two boys out getting those rocks off the site and rolling them down sure. the embankment. So there yeah. were, oh, no. But there is a map of, the, of some of those that okay. is, to me is invaluable. It shows what the village structure was like. There were mounds and the house outlines right up against one another, which is uh, frankly amazing. Mm -hmm. Bud Run is the largest Oneota site that we have discovered. And um, it was an Omaha village. The Iowa also lived there. The Ponca who were closely tied to the Omaha also lived there for a time. Mm -hmm. It was an exchange center. Uh, they were mining catlinite, which was in the pipestone quarries 60 miles away and bringing it back to Blood Run and processing it into tablets and pipes and decorative items, which were traded out as far as the Atlantic coast and into Canada, which again is to me is just amazing. It is an incredible sight. It is. Um so you kind of, I feel like you've already said one thing that sounds a little dangerous to me, but what, do you have another experience in your long career of archaeology that you would consider to be maybe the most dangerous or most adventurous kind of uh, situation you've been in? Uh, for example, I know some people deal with poisonous snakes or maybe rough terrain or everybody I think of has experienced some kind of bad storm in their time. But uh, do you have a good story you can share with us? I have one that I escaped and that is okay. uh, I was handling a crew from let's see, University of Missouri and I sent them down to clear off a mound so that we could map it and excavate into it to see what it was like. And I was sitting back at the field camp, writing probably one of those incredible reports. And um, they came back and they were not happy. I don't understand it. There were baby copperheads all over that mound. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> I spent quite a bit of time doing in copperheads or getting them off the mound or whatever. Oh, wow. 
we went back the next day and there were no copperheads at all. Hmm. But Interesting. That was danger for someone else. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily court danger. Uh, yeah. But I have several times excavated sites that were not supposed to be there. And uh, this also, this first happened really in Missouri. And uh, we were excavating um, a village site. In this case, in this case, the excavation was done with heavy equipment because they were working on the place to build a housing development. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we followed the equipment, which my crew said was pretty dangerous, but um, anything that showed up, like a storage pit, even a house, uh, we got the equipment to go around it and we hastily excavated, keeping track of what came out of it, locating it with a map, on a map, and then went on to the next thing. When we worked up the material, one of my students wrote his master's thesis on this site and discovered that um, there was late woodland and Cahokia, Mississippian in mm. the same pits. Mm. This was impossible because Cahokia developed out of Mississippi, out of uh, woodland, and the two never were mixed. But out in St. Louis County, they were mixed. He gave a paper on this uh, at a Midwest meeting, and um, one of the attendees, uh, James B. Griffin, of whom there was no witcher, had published immense amounts of material and made lots of statements about what should and shouldn't be found. Um, he listened to Bill's paper and uh, Bill had Corando ware and Mississippian pottery together in these pits. His first comment was, who dug that site? Oh, Dale Henning. I might have known, he said. <laughs> <laughs> and he never changed his mind about that. Hmm. Um, while I'm at that, oh, no, this is no trouble. Uh, he wanted to see all of the material that we excavated from the Mill Creek Project with climatic research. Mm -hmm. So I was asked to get out all of the pottery and put it out on tables for him to see it. And I, I got it all out from the Phipps site and Kimball site. That, was, that seemed to me enough, and it was enough for him. Well, he came and he looked it all over and we discussed it at great length. And um, I said, you know, there's no Mississippian pottery here. And he had published not once, but several times that Mill Creek formed because of Cahokia people coming out and uh, working with the natives and turned them into Mill Creek. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way I can say it. They were already Mill Creek and they had evolved out in that area. He obviously didn't believe me, but he didn't say anything. But he published two papers afterwards, uh, one of them much later, and it stayed the same, which um, I survived and so did he up to a point. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but these things are things that you kind of feel badly about when someone doesn't believe you. Yeah. That yeah. does happen elsewhere, too. Right. But, and I, th I think this still happens to archaeologists often today, yeah. too. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. So, again, you've sort of touched on this a little bit, too, and it's a pretty broad question. But um, how has archaeology as a, as a profession changed since your early years? Immensely. Yeah. yeah. What hasn't changed, I guess? <laughs> there, well, when Is I there... started, uh, the first professional meeting I went to was a Plains conference. And the room was filled with real characters. There's, there's no doubt about that. But every one of these people went into archaeology because they wanted to. 
and because there was just the least opportunity to do so. And um, I am sure that all of them had had a professor or someone around them early on who had said, you'll be lucky to get a job and you probably won't be able to feed your own children. But they did it anyway. Yeah. And that was what we saw, even with the people who were my contemporaries. We were there because that's what we were interested in. And we were willing to take a chance that we could do something professional and still make a living. Mm -hmm. That's changed. And it began to change when we got rules about what we should and should not dig. Archaeologists do not properly excavate cemeteries, prehistoric cemeteries, or mounds. Um, I'm still embarrassed about the mound on Blood Run that I was involved with mm. uh, because on Blood Run, I have worked with Omaha, Ponca, Iowa Indians, and uh, they probably all knew that I had, back in the day, Mm -hmm. excavated a mound and worked with human skeletal material, but we never discussed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, in certain states, you just don't touch any human bone at all. You don't mm -hmm. excavate it. In other states, there are ways of getting access or having to do this kind of work. But it's also possible for a student to decide he wants or she wants to become an archaeologist because there's usually a job mm. of some kind. Yeah. Um, you found a job and you wanted a job, of course, mm -hmm. but um, that wasn't true mm -hmm. when I started. And it doesn't make any of these old guys any better than anybody else. We just were more foolish. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, now setting up a research project is what I think people in uh, CRM ought to be doing, cultural resource management ought to be doing. But it's really impossible because the contracts usually do not offer enough money to write up solid reports. Mm -hmm. That it finds one doing what I have been doing since I retired. And sure. actually, before I retired, I had slowed down to the point where I could get some things published. And um, this material that is being excavated now goes into storage, and the reports are minimal. They will pass muster for um, a, an entity that hires the work done. And the entity, entity doing the hiring would prefer to make it as cheap as possible. So there's a constant battle going on there. But um, there are quite a number of people who do cultural resource work who get their work done. They mm -hmm. write a report and they retain their interest in what they have excavated. And that I think is extremely important. Absolutely. So uh, tell us tell us what kind of research you're working on right now, Dale. <laughs> well, it's hard for me to believe, but my master's thesis uh, included material from the Correctionville Oneota site, which is one that there was a collection from there. Mm -hmm. And um, I had added to that as a graduate student and so I wrote it up as one of the sites, Oneota sites, that um, I was interested in and got it into my master's thesis. Well, since then, I felt kind of guilty about some things I should have done for the thesis. And um, so now I am doing them. And I've gotten back into that same site and some other sites that are closely related and find that uh, I've actually learned something since... Yeah. I did that master's thesis, mm -hmm. and I'm delighted with the opportunity to do that work. So that's what I'm working on right now. That's great. I'm doing back work, and uh, 
Any archaeologist worth his salt or her salt is going to have back work. Yeah. Even if yeah. it's redoing a site that was done once before. Right. Yep. Awesome. I should pitch in a little bit more about Blood Run because sure. there, there's more to it. Yeah. There's part of the site that is on the South Dakota site, actually parts of the site. We have discovered that there's quite a bit more of the site on the South Dakota side. Mm -hmm. People in South Dakota were seeing uh, Sioux Falls housing move over to the Big Sioux River, a great place to live where you can see the river and see eagles and so on. And people were buying up lots and putting up mini mansions and other housing along the river. People in the parks, South Dakota parks, decided to try to save some of the Blood Run site and preserve it as a state park. I got involved with that, I guess, maybe because I had the time or maybe they thought I knew something about Blood Run. Um, but some of the work I have done most recently, physical work, was done in preparing for the um, park. And I did work with the Ponca and the Osage, or pardon me, and the Omaha in um, looking at the site and looking at sacred areas. Mm -hmm. It turns out the whole place is sacred area. And um, then came the opportunity for them to make a case for it. Um, probably the most important and surprising thing was in clearing the site for the first um, shelter house or exhibit house of the park. They had a beautiful plan and a nice area to put the site in, and they thought, and correctly, that they should clear the site and make sure there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. So it was my job to um, kind of keep keep an eye on things and um, make sure there was nothing there. Uh, I had help from Iowa, Tribe, Ponca, and Omaha, and some parks people that had a little time. And we ran heavy equipment across a three and a half acre space um, just to clear off the plow zone and make sure there was, as I said, nothing there. What did we find there but geoglyphs? I had had no experience with geoglyphs until maybe a year before and was visiting a project that was run by Dave Ben. Mm -hmm. for uh, Bear Creek Archaeology. And they ran into a woodland site or woodland sites, and here were geoglyphs. These are trenches that were dug as outlines for thunderbirds, human beings, turtles, and other creatures for sacred purposes. And what did we find? but a host of geoglyphs on the <clears throat> projected location where the uh, Good Earth State Park was going to build a building. Um, I called Dave Ben uh, within minutes of the time I realized that this was what we had. Mm -hmm. And I said, you'll never guess what we found. <clears throat> I told him. And he said, well, you know, that changes everything. And <laughs> I said, in what way? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, he said, apparently those things are going to turn up in other places as well. Right. And indeed, they did. On other places on the park, there were a few geoglyphs. But this was three and a half acres filled with them. They mm -hmm. were not well spaced out. There were geoglyphs going through geoglyphs and so on. Yeah. This is one of those places that people would rather I hadn't found anything. Yeah. And I suspect, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that if I had excavated that or cleared that area 20 years ago, 
I would have assumed that these things were animal trenches because I would not have seen that they related mm -hmm. one to another. Yeah. No experience with it and no knowledge of it. And the timing was just right. The people in Iowa had found these and they opened up big shovel areas. And we found the same thing opening up big um, cleared areas with using machinery. Mm -hmm. uh, the parks people took it pretty well. <laughs> they hired another um, architect and designed another nice building, but they were pretty smart. Uh, they never really got down very far below the surface. Mm -hmm. They built up a surface of engineering soil or engineered mm -hmm. soil. Sure. That building may be on geoglyphs, but the geoglyphs are protected and the building sits on top of them, which I think was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a good example of how we can work with uh, planners to protect these sites, yeah. uh, but still um, accomplish the projects we need to get done. Now we still have people that doubt those things exist and mm -hmm. others who hope they don't. But right, right. Keep you up at night, I guess. Real. They're very yeah. real. Yeah. Thank you, Dale. Uh, so my last question is just if you have any advice for um, any students out there who are um, thinking about majoring in archaeology or maybe who are just finishing up their degree in archaeology, uh, do you have any advice for them and for their careers? Well, I didn't take the advice I got. <laughs> stick with being a dentist. Yeah. Dr. Hill, by the way, was all absolutely against that. He said, don't do it. It's too mm -hmm. boring. And so yeah. I took that advice. But yeah. uh, as far as a professor in the same field, no. Mm -hmm. um, the world changes all the time, and it's difficult for someone my age to assume that I am going to be able to predict the future. The future for doing archaeology has been and promises to be pretty good as long as those laws stay in place. Now, there are people, even in government, who would like to set those laws aside or weaken them considerably. And so far, they have not. But um, anyway, I think if I were to give advice, and okay, I will, I would seize upon a specialty that works with archeology, span uh, dating, uh, identification of uh, small objects, let's say that we've been throwing away for years, um, soil chemistry, take, take two or three majors, which is, not easily done, but at least okay. develop a specialty that um, can help. Because um, I might not have been hired as an archaeologist, but if I was a soils expert, maybe mm -hmm. I could have been. I took mm -hmm. a soils minor, which I have used minimally. Uh, but that part of it is because I'm colorblind and you have to see colors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's important. <laughs> but I found that out kind of in the course of taking the minor, and I went ahead and finished it. Sure. But um, I'd say, yes, develop a specialty. I think that's and, great advice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're running on 50 minutes here, so I suppose we better uh, get to any questions. Uh, so if Elizabeth, if you want to come back and give us some questions. Yeah, I'm back and I'm joined by my office mate Critter, who's here to see his fans who have been emailing about him. Um, there are a couple of questions so far. So this goes along lines with what you were talking about, but when when were you first introduced to the blood blood run site? What year? And then is there any work still being done there? Well, let's see. Well, um, you mean when did I first go on the site? Yeah, what year? Probably 1963. Okay. 
and um, we did an excavation there in 1964. And from that time forward, I've been on and off the site doing one thing and another for quite a while. And you're probably one of the only archaeologists who's doing work there at the moment, I believe. I think so. Um, the parks people in Iowa have less than a little interest in having a park there. The people in South Dakota would rather not uh, have their plans <laughs> changed. And the Indians' tribes would prefer that no more digging be done. Yeah. And uh, I can understand all of those. Um, I find it, for me, it's unfortunate because I would like to um, see some excavations done on both ends of the sites and see some um, comparative material from some place other than where we did a concentrated effort in 85 and 86. And that is really all we know about excavated material from Blood Run. The rest is all surface and stories about what people found when they dug into a mound. And those stories are now pretty much over. But with your research, we still keep getting a richer and richer picture. Oh, of sure. things. And I research in the literature. Um, I've been concerned with where the uh, pipes have gone and uh, what routes were taken to get them where they wound up. In New York State, of all things, uh, they're finding pipes that I'm quite sure were made at Blood Run or maybe be even other sites earlier. So. so we've got a question from Bill Green. Can you share any recollections of the West Broken Kettle field work and how did it compare to other field schools you've run? West Broken Kettle is a um, great oasis village. I'm sure closely related to Mill Creek Village that's right across the creek. Um, West Broken Kettle has all been transferred to the state archaeologist office. I know, knew full well 10 years ago that I was never, ever going to get through all of that material. Uh, we dug, the University of Nebraska had field school there, excavated four houses, and some of those houses were just loaded with material. And uh, getting through all of that pottery, projectile points, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is, was impossible. So I have given up on that. And um, I think probably the Office of State Archaeologist will get that in print. Yeah, we, sh we sure hope so. Uh, several hellos, Catherine Koskovich, Mary De La Garza, Cherie Hari Arts, uh, Kelly Rendell says hi, and that they were honored to interview you for Lost Nation, yeah. the Iowa, and Good Earth, Good Earth Awakening, the Silent City. And I would highly recommend that our viewers find those movies from their local libraries and watch them because they're they're pretty amazing. Hello from Steve Elwood, and Shayla Big Soldier is tuning in from Oklahoma. She is an enrolled member of the Iowa Tribe of Oklahoma. I didn't get the last name. Big soldier. Mm -hmm. um, any any quick stories about Ellison Orr? Uh, oh, yes. On our trips with Doc Field, we would pick up Ellison Orr, and um, his wife had become quite senile, and we always wondered well, how, what she would say to us when we came to the door. So kids and all would come up the door and ask if Ellison was home. And sure he was, he was going on a trip with us. And she, I remember one time she turned around, and she said, Ellison, sheriff's come to get you. <laughs> so we went. He often smoked a cigar and he was always in the front seat. And I remember Doc Field admonishing his two boys 
not to do fake coughs. No coughing, he said. <laughs> and sure enough, Orr lit up the cigar and the smoke went back into the back seat uh -huh. and they didn't cough. Yeah, Orr was wonderful. I just admired him no end. Must have been pretty remarkable. I mean, he's a legend in Iowa archaeology, so to have had interactions with him, um, it's just been amazing to yeah. listen to you and to listen to these stories for this yeah. the last hour flew by. And I'm mm -hmm. sure most people could listen to you talk for another several hours. Someone did say that uh, Don Newton said this was not the least bit boring, Dale. Oh, that's good. <laughs> And I then, learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I did too. I think you probably, I think you've got some family watching as well. Sarah Henning Iverson says hello. Oh, good. My goodness. And you also mentioned the Iowa Archaeological Society. So I'm just going to throw this link up that anybody can join the Iowa Archaeological Society, whether you're a professional archaeologist or just interested in archaeology. Uh, we meet a couple of times a year. There's a business meeting coming up on October 17th to do some voting, but no presentations this year. But with an IAS membership, you get mailed the newsletters and the journal, and you're put on the listserv so you can hear about various events. And there are several local chapters that you can join as well. So I think we'll wrap this up. Thank you so much to Dale Henning for being interviewed and Megan for interviewing him. Thank it is, you so much, It, it takes some guts to put yourself out there on a live stream. <laughs> and I just appreciate you both rolling with this. You got it set up, set up pretty slick for us, Elizabeth. <laughs> Thank you for having us. I so enjoyed we'll, hearing myself speak too, so thank <laughs> you. And these videos will be available for anybody to watch on Facebook or YouTube afterwards. Okay. So we'll say goodbye to our, our viewers. Thank you again.